and now. Well, good evening. Welcome to the International Dyslexia Association Georgia Branch Wednesday webinar series with our first presentation featuring Dr. Devin Kearns. On behalf of the IDA Georgia Board of Directors, I'd like to thank our supporters and the many sponsors shown on our screen for helping to underwrite this evening's presentation. Our planning committee has spent countless hours with planning details, so I'd also like to thank these members. Our conference and webinar chairs are Lisa Murray and Kim Day, and they were supported by many uh, committee members, including Anne Marie Lewis, Kelly Schreiner, Mary McPherson, Rachel Pierce, Delilah Landrum, and Tara Terry. The webinar series is designed to provide important information on dyslexia to educators, parents, students, and interested individuals. IDA Georgia is a nonprofit organization, and we hope you'll visit our website often for updated information. Please consider registering for our additional Wednesday webinar sessions, um, if you haven't already. Uh, these include uh, April 24th, we'll have our second presentation, which will be led by two esteemed professors who happen to be board members for IDA Georgia as well. Jennifer Lindstrom and Nora Schlesinger will discuss what educators need to know about dyslexia training programs. And then on April 28th, Terry Patton from the Florida Center for Reading Research will talk about the power of research, innovation, and engagement to ensure that children learn to read. So we hope you'll join us for these additional Wednesday webinars. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Kim Day, who is the co-chair of our conference and webinar committee, and she also serves as the director of research and development for the Skank School. Thank you so much, Renee. Um, and again, welcome to everyone. Uh, we're pleased you've joined us uh, this evening. IDA Georgia is excited to present the Dyslexia Knowledge Series and we hope you learn a lot from our speaker this evening, Dr. Devin Kearns. Before I introduce Dr. Kearns, I wanna let you know that there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation this evening. If you have any questions for Dr. Kearns, please submit them at any time uh, through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we have a Q&A moderator, Lisa Murray, uh, also a board member of IDA Georgia, who will be monitoring your questions to pass along to Dr. Kearns. Again, please submit your questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, all of you to our speaker this evening, Dr. Devin Kearns. Dr. Kearns is an associate professor in the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Connecticut. He researches reading disabilities, including dyslexia in school-aged children. His research focuses on linking educational practice to cognitive science and neuroscience in collaboration with colleagues at Haskins Laboratories and also the Brain Imaging Research Center at the University of Connecticut. Dr. Kearns and his colleagues examine the neurobiological change that occurs as students learn to read. Currently, they are developing a new reading intervention designed to link word reading and meaning and then examining how this intervention affects students' patterns of cognitive processing. Dr. Kearns and his colleagues are also developing and testing a game-based dyslexia screening app for young learners age four through eight called AppRise. Dr. Kearns has seven years of classroom experience as a teacher, literacy coach, and reading specialist. He continues to help schools and districts implement high quality reading instruction, including demonstrating how to implement evidence-based reading instruction. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Devin Kearns. Great, thank you, Kim, for that very nice introduction. I always say like, now that you give me a nice introduction, I actually have to do a good job. So I will do my level best to do that. So let me go ahead and share the slides for the presentation. Uh, so as you know from the title of the webinar, the topic today is not just what is dyslexia, but also what kind of instruction will help. 
And I'm gonna divide it into two parts and talk first about what it is and then about the instruction. And I wanna thank IDA Georgia for inviting me to speak to you all and um, for the committee, especially to Kim, who I've gotten to communicate with many times over the past year or so. We planned to do this a long time ago. Um, I'm thrilled to do it now. So what is dyslexia? I'm gonna start by asking the question, what is reading? And in fact, I really wanna ask you, what is reading comprehension? And to get us in a frame of mind on this uh, evening, what I wanna do is ask you to do a little bit of reading. And so I'm gonna give you a few minutes, not a few minutes, a few seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds or so, to read uh, Monsignor in Town, which is a passage, a little section from A Tale of Two Cities. And so I'm gonna put it on the screen. I'm gonna give you about 20 seconds to read it. It's only about 50 words. It should be relatively easy to read. So go ahead and read this. Okay, I gave you about 30 seconds. So if you read it about the speed of an average third grader, you should have been able to read that just fine. Uh, and you should be able to answer this comprehension question, which is, um, what was Monsignor eating? <laughs> and if you don't know the answer to that question, I wouldn't be surprised. And the goal today is to help you understand why it is that was difficult for you as a way of thinking about why reading is difficult for students with dyslexia. So I want to think about what it takes to comprehend a text or a paragraph like the one that you just read. I'm going to talk about constructing what's called the situation model, which is a mental representation of the key ideas in the text that updates as you add new ideas by reading new sentences and paragraphs and text. And to do this, I'm going to actually have us think about a different text, uh, which is from Peter Rabbit. So this is a little easier to read. I'll give you another few seconds to read this. I'll still give you about 20 seconds and it should be easier to get this one. So take a few seconds to read that just to give us a framework for what I'll talk about. All right, so that was about 20 seconds or so. That should have been a little bit easier to read. Um, I don't know about you, but when I found this uh, to put together a presentation, I didn't remember the part about uh, their father and the pie, which turns out to be a little disturbing for a children's book, but there it is. It's not the 1800s anymore, and we don't write text that way. Uh, but, but this is the text I'm going to use to help us frame our understanding of reading and how uh, we get to reading comprehension. So our goal is to construct what's called a situation model, which involves processing the surface structure of the text, assembling the text base from the surface structure, and then extracting the situation model. So we talk about how that might work with Peter Rabbit. So here's the first sentence of the text, and we do the processing of the situation model on a sentence by sentence basis. So we can extract um, the parts of the surface structure it really is about understanding kind of the parts of speech of each of the units in the text, each of the words in the text. So the word names gets associated with the names of the bunnies and the person understands that those are nouns. And that doesn't mean consciously knows the grammar, but processes the idea that those are nouns. And then there's also the idea that there are four little rabbits, which is like a noun, but it's a noun phrase. And that's another unit that the learner would be able to process. There's also here a being verb that's part of the understanding of the surface structure. And there's also a prepositional phrase that you have to understand. So these are the parts of the surface structure, but you'll notice here that they're not particularly organized. They're sort of in this random scattered order. And our second task is to assemble the text base. And assembling the text base is really about taking all of those individual words and putting them together in a systematic way. So we know, for example, that the word war, were is connected with once upon a time and also with the four little rabbits. We also know that the four little rabbits have names and that those names are Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. So all of that is all of that uh, text base is then used to identify key concepts that we'll then use to construct the situation model. 
I'm going to indicate the importance of concepts by changing the size, the size of certain words and making certain things disappear. So when we identify key concepts in a text, not everything's important. For example, the word were is not essential to our understanding. And the idea of the four little rabbits really is about rabbits. And that idea is really important in that first sentence. We also know that once upon a time is important, not only because it's the first thing in the text, but we also know that that gives us a frame for the entire text. I'll say more about in a moment. And the names are important. Again, I got rid of the word were because it's not really critical to the situation model. And so that is how we construct the key idea of the key concepts in the text. And the size represents their importance to the understanding. But there's another piece to this, which is inferring. Not only do we need to look at these parts of the text space, we need to make inferences about what these parts mean. So for example, we have these components here. There are four bunnies, and we need to understand that there are four of them. So that is an inference. A second thing we need to do is understand that rabbits are children and that the children, rabbit children are also called bunnies. That's another inference way to vocabulary that uh, a student would need to make. And finally, the words once upon a time tell us that this is a fairy tale, which also gives us the information that animals talk. So now that we've assembled the text base and understood the relative importance of different words and how they might be connected, we take the most critical parts of this and we put them together. So we know that there are bunnies. We know, and here are the bunnies and their mother. We know that there are four of them. Here are the four of them in that picture. And we know that this is a fairy tale. And this little image here is just my, I imagine like a snow globe. I try to make it look like a snow globe. It doesn't exactly, I don't know what it looks like, but um, this thing is supposed to represent the idea that this is a fairy tale and fanciful things happen with these rabbits. I apologize for giving you a silly graphic, but I think it just helps understand the idea that this is a fairy tale. And what we do ultimately is to construct the situation model for the first text that looks like this. This is a fairy tale about four bunnies. That's what we extract from the first sentence in the text. So reading comprehension is about doing what I just described to you. It's about constructing that situation model. However, this can be really difficult for some students. Why? There are several possible reasons thinking about the three components I just talked to you about. A student could have difficulty processing the surface structure, actually identifying the words and essentially the parts of speech, putting those ideas together in a logical order to construct that text space you saw as that kind of um, you know, boxes and arrows map of the text, and then selecting the most important ideas from that text. And this, these processes require us to have a set of skills that tonight it's my job to describe to you to help you understand how each of the skills involved is required in order to complete the task of reading comprehension. And this fits into what's called the simple view of reading. And I'm sure that many of you on the presentation have heard of the simple view of reading before, but I think it bears um, further description because what I'm going to show you is how the simple view of reading contains the components that then relate to the problem associated with dyslexia. So let's talk about that simple view of reading. There are two parts to it. One is word recognition, and the second is language comprehension. Originally, they call it linguistic comprehension, but and they also, for word recognition, they said decoding, the original authors of the study, Hoover and Goff. But I'm gonna talk about is word recognition and language comprehension, which is the way many researchers describe it these days. So remember that the idea here is that reading comprehension is about putting word recognition and language comprehension together. But it's not simply that you have the, the, these general concepts, their component skills to them, all of which are essential for constructing that text space. So let's start, talk first about word recognition. I'm gonna to present to you kind of three areas of skill that are necessary for someone to have good word recognition skills. So let's talk first about phonological awareness. I'm gonna keep returning to Beatrix Potter's uh, Tale of Peter Rabbit. And I'm gonna talk about some of the words in there. One of the words in here is, um, can be composed of the syllables cot and tun, right? For cottontail. So the uh, the cot and tan, uh, tan there, that becomes cotton. 
And what you'll notice here is that the cot and the tan or tan um, then becomes something that looks quite different. These are, this is a way, way to represent speech sounds. What you'll notice is that when we look at the individual syllables and then we try to put them together, the way our mouth say it is a little bit different. So if you hear cot and tan, when you say cotton, most of us don't say the middle T the way you would think of. Some people say cotton, uh, a good friend of mine says cotton, but most people say cotton and we change that middle sound. We also do this at a phoneme level. So if uh, we looked at the word, uh, we looked at, uh, here are some sounds in one of the words in the passage, b, a, n, and k. Now those are the sounds you might think are in the word bank that look similar to bank, but in fact, those aren't actually the sounds. That letter, n, that n sound there is not actually how we pronounce that in this word. In fact, we actually use an ng sound, which is a little bit different. And we have this um, little tilde thing you see there that should be over the E that indicates that that A sound, this is the A sound in the International Phonetic Alphabet. It doesn't just sound like an A, it sounds like an eh. I'm sorry for giving you that weird pronunciation, but bank, right? You can hear in my voice that that, uh, that A sound or the A sound is not exactly the same as when we say b, a, n, and k. So we have to, when we are readers, take sounds, sometimes they're not quite the same as the word themselves, and we have to be able to assemble those. So reading depends on us being able to detect the sounds and words and manipulate them in the way that we're doing here to blend them. And spelling is an exercise that requires actually the opposite, which is segmenting a spoken word in order to write the letters in it. But you can see here how we need those phonological skills. So that's related to the cotton example. Let's move on talking about decoding skill. Decoding skill has to do with identifying sound spelling units and combining them to pronounce unfamiliar words. And I'm going to talk more about how to teach this a little bit later, but I want to explain what I mean by doing that. So we have the word rabbits in the text. We could decode it by associating every letter, r, a, b, b, it, and s. We associate every one of those letters with a sound. And then we take that and we use our phonological awareness skills to put it together. And we say rabbits, which you can see here looks a little bit different than the individual sounds, but it's pretty close. And we use our phonological awareness skills to figure out how these things, how those sounds fit together to uh, create the spoken word. So that's how we use decoding skill. We use those individual letter sounds then to assemble the word to pronounce the correct word. The third piece of the puzzle is sight recognition. And here I don't simply mean sight words, uh, which some people think of as non-decodable words. When I say sight recognition today, and this is the way researchers talk about it, is this has to do with immediate recognition of words you've seen before. So if we again look at Peter Rabbit, sight recognition does include recognizing words that are less decodable. You can see there I've highlighted the word once. But it also includes uh, reading the word with by sight, which is a word that kind of, quote, follows the rules. It's decodable, but it would still be a word that we would commit to our sight memory, that once we've encountered it once, twice, three times, typically researchers think it about, takes about three to five times to remember a word uh, upon sight. And once you do that, you can read once and with almost instantly. And we do that for most words. So you can see here now I've highlighted most of the words in the story. And most of these words for some students will become so well known that as soon as they see them, they will recognize them by sight. You see here, I haven't made pink here some of the words that may be less familiar to a reader, like the names of the bunnies, the part of neath and underneath and maybe the word fur, those are things that might have to be decoded, but, but eventually the, all of these things will be recognized by, by sight. So that's the third piece of word recognition is recognizing words by sight, which includes words that people think of as kind of non-decodable, words like once, but also words like with that are decodable and high in frequency and words that are less high in frequency, like root, but eventually after seeing them a couple of times, we can remember them. So that's what word record, these are component skills of word recognition that we're going to need for reading comprehension. Let's look at the second piece of the puzzle, which is language comprehension. For language comprehension, we're gonna start by talking about 
Uh, here are five kind of components of this. This is one way to characterize them. There are others, but this is the way I've organized them. And the first piece of that is background knowledge. So let's talk about, about what background knowledge means. Background knowledge is about, and sometimes called prior knowledge, is about things you know about a text before you begin to read it. So let's return again, return again to Peter Rabbit and we think about what do we know about this text before we begin to read? Well, uh, you might know, someone might know that rabbits live in burrows, which you can see in the picture, but it's important to understand that they're you know, living under a sandbank um, by a river and, they, and that the rabbits live in burrows. Another thing, and this is a little macabre, you'll forgive me, but it is, you know, the evening, and so I want to just give you a little levity, maybe. Um, you also might need to know for that second paragraph that rabbits are edible. That would be helpful to know in the pie situation, although, you know, hopefully it wouldn't come up too much, but a little macabre, but, you know, hopefully you're enjoying that for your, for your evening. Um, so that's prior knowledge, background knowledge that might be useful in helping you comprehend the text. That's background knowledge. Let's talk then about vocabulary knowledge. Vocabulary knowledge has to do with a couple of things. One, it has to do with knowledge of specific words and also has to do with how you figure out words that are not familiar to you. So again, in Peter Rabbit, one word that might not be entirely clear to a reader is the word fields. And the reader needs to understand the specific definition of fields, which is, you don't need to know it by these words, but a large plot where crops grow. It's important there to understand that fields are something like this, uh, and that it's different than, say, a garden, for example. Um, a field is somewhat different. It's a sort of a kind of garden, but it's not exactly the same, that it's different than a lane, which is also mentioned here. And so having knowledge of that specific definition is really important. The ability to figure out words means that frequently that you can use context to understand the meanings of words. When I say context, people, also uh, often think that uh, I'm talking about using context clues to pronounce words. That's not what I mean here. I'm talking about using context to understand the meanings of words. So context might help you understand something about fields. So for example, from this passage, you might figure out using context that fields are not in fact the same as the gardens or the lane, because you can see here that go into the fields or down the lane, which are different things, but don't go to the garden, which is yet again a different thing. So you can use context to infer something new about the meaning of the word. So that's vocabulary knowledge that's necessary for reading comprehension. The third piece of the puzzle is verbal reasoning. And this has to do with the ideas that I talked about with the situation model, which is the ability to figure out what are the more and less important parts of the, of the, of the text. So I often talk about them as thinking skills, skills that you can use to help you construct the situation model when you are reading something new. And so when you look at the entire text, you might be able to figure out some important concepts by uh, processing them using your thinking skills. So for example, you know in this second paragraph here that the key ideas are that their bunny's mother told them not to go into the garden. Um, and you can use those thinking skills to make inferences. Uh, that's another part of verbal reasoning. And to be able to answer the question why she wouldn't let them go to the garden, which as I've already pointed out, has to do something with this. So uh, I'm not gonna describe it further, but you get the idea uh, what you could infer by knowing about um, why she wouldn't let them go to the garden. So we need to use those verbal reasoning skills to make inferences and to think about key what are more important ideas in the text represented here by the size of the font. In addition to verbal reasoning, we also need skill in using syntax and language structure. And that's really critical uh, when you think about that, uh, that surface structure I described. And this is what we call implicit knowledge of grammatical structure within and across sentences. And so the word implicit is important because it doesn't mean you have to know grammar uh, literally in order to process language structure, but it does mean that you have to have this kind of understanding that you know, a noun is a thing, a verb is often an action and so on. So that's implicit knowledge the reader needs to help them process the text. And it might be represented in Peter Rabbit by thinking about all the ways that uh, Mrs. Ra old Mrs. Rabbit is described in the text and using uh, an understanding of anaphora. 
And then Nafra have to do with the idea of recognizing what are often called pronoun references. And I am certain for those of you who are teachers, you have seen, and for those of your parents and maybe yourself, uh, you've seen that it can be difficult for students to identify the links among the words in the text. When they see their, when a student sees their mother, they might not recognize that that is in fact the same as old Mrs. Rabbit mentioned twice. And when the word I is mentioned, quotation marks, it might not be obvious that uh, that also refers to old Mrs. Rabbit or that her refuse, or refers to old Mrs. Rabbit or even she. And so skill in using syntax and language structure allows you to understand the relationships between all of those words in the text. And going back to my description of reading comprehension, this is how you begin to identify the surface structure as you saw me kind of show how the words are related in kind of categories. So that's the fourth piece of the puzzle is having that skill and syntax and language structure. And I'll add here that this is an emerging area of research in terms of intervention and that some of my colleagues are studying whether we can improve students reading by focusing on helping them process the syntax and structure better. Um, but that's an emerging area of research. And finally, we need the ability to apply effective strategies. When I think about this in terms of reading, I think of it as tools for unlocking text. So some one way to think about what a text is, is to construct that situation model, you have to kind of unlock it or you know break it open, I guess. Here's a treasure chest and this is the text. We're trying to get into the text. And sometimes accessing that is challenging for readers. And they need a way to think about what to do when they're stuck. So if they say, I don't get this, I need help. They then have strategies. They think, what can I do to help me unlock this text? How can I process this sentence, this paragraph and so on? And then if the reader has it, they might have a strategy like summarizing and they use that summarizing strategy to help them understand uh, the key ideas in the text. So now, Summarizing allows us to unlock the text, a strategy that allows us to process the text space and construct that situation model when we don't get it. And that's uh, something that teachers often teach students to do. So the ability to apply effective strategies is the fifth piece of that puzzle. So we said the reading comprehension takes both of these. And so we need the word recognition part and we need the language comprehension part. And what you'll see here is when we put those things together, it requires word recognition, language comprehension. When we do those things speedily and accurately, that's what we think of as fluency. And when we put these skills together fluently, these spiral up into reading comprehension. I meant to make this a spiral, but I didn't get it. I didn't get the animation right. So it looks like a, you know, a fir tree, but you know, you're just gonna have to deal with that. But you get the idea that these, these uh, pieces spiral together. So I have not even talked about dyslexia yet, and that was intentional, not because I'm not going to, because I'm now going to talk for a while now about dyslexia. But what I wanted to do was to give you a framework for thinking about how these ideas fit together. So what's critical here is for you to understand that, um, that when we think about word recognition and language comprehension, you can have deficits, deficits in either of these areas that make it difficult for you to process language. So dyslexia fits into this in the sense that when you have difficulty in terms of word recognition, that's a word reading deficit. Language comprehension is a deficit in language comprehension. And it's dyslexia that has to do with um, that, that has to do with word recognition or word reading. So I want to be clear about this because people often uh, get a little bit confused about um, whether dyslexia involves a lot of other processes. Um, dyslexia is primarily a word reading deficit. However, it's unlikely that uh, students will have only a problem with word recognition. Often students have some difficulty with word recognition and some difficulty with language comprehension. Students who have word recognition difficulty, those are students that we would identify as having dyslexia. And there's some controversy about whether students who have language, com language comprehension problems as well as word recognition problems should be considered to have dyslexia. My task today is not to talk about whether uh, that fits into a model of uh, language, uh, model of dyslexia. My job today is to talk about um, the fact that 
these are the processes that are involved in dyslexia. It's word recognition that becomes the challenge in terms of dyslexia. So moving from that then, um, we want to think about how dyslexia is related to reading comprehension. So the problem with dyslexia is that it prevents reading comprehension. So you probably recall looking at this. This is the model of uh, comprehension, the model, the text I asked you to read at the beginning today. This is Monsignor in town. And I've highlighted there some of the words that it may have been challenging for you to read because I put them in the international phonetic alphabet. And I did that to represent the idea that you might not be able to recognize those words. And if you can't recognize the words, basically it's going to prevent you from doing all the tasks involved in constructing the situation model. You can't identify the surface structure. And because you, because you can't actually process the words, you can't figure out whether things nouns or verbs or noun phrases, prepositional phrases, if you can't even understand uh, how the surface structure works, how it is that um, the words in the text are, are uh, related because you can't actually, you don't actually know what the words are. As a result, you won't even be, again, you won't even be able to begin to understand the sentences in that text base because again, you haven't been able to process the key ideas in the text. And then you can't even consider constructing that situation model because you haven't been able to process any of the ideas in the text. So you can see here that there's a link between the surface structure, the text space, and the situation model, and that dyslexia prevents the reader from processing the, tech, the surface structure so that they aren't ever able to get, oops, so we aren't ever able to get to the situation model because the reader simply can't process it. So that's the first half of the presentation, which is to talk about what we can do about it. Or what, we, what, what, we, what dyslexia is, it's this word recognition problem. And so what can we do about this problem? So I'm gonna to present to you some ideas about what we can do. We're gonna have lots of time for questions uh, for me to answer for you tonight. Uh, so we, one thing we can do is not read Monsignor in town. So I'd probably recommend not reading that. But what we can also do is provide instruction using structured literacy. So structured literacy is a form of instruction that might help students. So that's answering the question, what kind of instruction will help? Structured literacy is often called also explicit systematic phonics instruction. This involves phonological awareness. I'm gonna describe each of these things to you. Learning sound spellings, decoding words using phonics skills and recognizing high frequency words, especially words that are harder for students to decode. This approach to instruction can actually result in change in the brain. So if you look at this picture, you can see here, this is a graphic of how students' brains process information prior to intervention and then with intervention. So if you see on the left here in the pre-intervention space, you can see that there is relatively limited, uh, this is a pattern of brain activation. So this is showing the parts of the brain that are activated when we read. This is a picture of the left hemisphere of the brain. And you can see there are two areas that are circled here. One is the inferior frontal gyrus, which is this one here. And then there's another one in the temporal parietal region. It's also called Broca's area, uh, Bernicke's area. This one here is called Broca's area sometimes. It's Bernicke's area. And this is also not activated very strongly in students who haven't received intervention. Uh, it is thought that the inferior frontal gyrus has to do with processing speech and processing speech sounds. And it's thought that the uh, Wernicke's area, the temporal parietal region is, has to do with matching up letters and sounds and even meaning to process them as, uh, uh, to put them together as components. And so readers with dyslexia often don't process these things well. They have difficulty putting together letter and sound information in order to read words. Uh, which you can see in a lot of cases, you might have a student who can read a word, can read the sounds and word like fan, they could say f, a, and n, but they might not be able to put together f, a, and n to say fan, because that a sound changes the a sound, much like the bank example I gave you before. Speech is also a challenge for students with uh, dyslexia, and so they don't process that as well as students who don't have dyslexia. There's a third part 
of the reading puzzle that occurs here, which is in the, uh, uh, this is in the occipital temporal lobe. This is called the fusiform gyrus, sometimes called the visual word form area. And typically we would see activation in this area. But in the pre-intervention space, we don't see any of that. Actually, what we see is a very low level of activation. But what's exciting to know is that intervention can actually change all of that. So when you provide high quality intervention, you go from students having these difficulties where they are not processing the sounds in words to case where they do process the sounds in words. They're able to make this leap from uh, not having access to the sound structure of the language to improving their access to the sound structure of the language. Similarly, here you can see that there's a di an additional activation uh, in the area, in Wernicke's area, related to matching up letters and sounds and meaning. So readers are actually improving their ability to link those parts of the words together. And you can see here, there's also greater activation in the visual word form area that has to do with linking all three components, all three of those components together. So this graphic I think is really exciting because it shows that you as teachers uh, can make a big difference for students with dyslexia. It also shows that for those of you who are parents of students with dyslexia, children with dyslexia, um, instruction, high quality instruction designed to prevent reading difficulty can make a big difference for those students. And I've written here after intervention, metabolic brain activity of children with dyslexia more closely resembles that of typical readers, which is to say that we can change the processing in kids' brains. And actually we can make it seem more like the processing of students who don't have difficulty. What I'll add there is that there is some indication that it may not be that the brains of uh, children with dyslexia end up looking exactly the same as the brains of students without dyslexia. There is some evidence that there are slightly different patterns of processing for some students, uh, but it is mostly the case that we can sort of normalize students' reading skills by providing them with high quality intervention. Let me talk a little bit about how we might provide this high quality intervention. The first recommendation I'm gonna to make to you is to use a program, or if you are a parent to uh, know that the teacher, your children's teachers are using a program. And here again, I mean an explicit systematic phonics program. And again, I'll say more about the components of an explicit systematic phonics program in a little bit, but you might use, and you would use a foundational skills curriculum that focuses on structured literacy. So here's one creative reading solutions. Now you'll note at the bottom of the slide, it says that this is an imaginary program, which it is, this is not a real program. Um, and when you implement a program, you wanna implement all of the parts of the program because they're designed in a certain way to make sure that students are learning all of the things that are necessary to understand the, uh, to understand language in order to, uh, do all the things that are necessary for structured literacy that will give them the ability to access the situation model. So in the CRS Creative Reading Solutions, there are a set of components. There are these sound spelling cards, there are phonological awareness game routines, there are ways to read words with specific procedures, there are spelling and decoding routines. I'm gonna give you an example of a decoding routine a little bit later. There are special decodable books for students to read and there are all of these letter cards. And when you use a program, it's important to actually use all the components. I mention that because sometimes I notice that people who are using a program may not be using all the parts of the program. So for example, when I ask again, are you using all the parts of the program? People often say, well, sometimes I leave a few things out and I am often, you know, understanding and say, okay, well, what have you been doing if you haven't been doing all the parts of the program? And they'll say something like, well, I focus mostly on the letter cards and use the words from the phonics component. So again, I wanna emphasize that I said, I put in italics here, I said, use a program. But what you saw in that example for the person who said that they focus mostly on the letter cards and use the words, well, we're not really using the sound spelling cards. And we're not really, using the phonological awareness activities. And we're not really reading the words with the specific procedures. And we're not really using the spelling and decoding routines. And we're not using those decodable books. 
We're left with the words and the letter cards. And so I would argue that we're not in fact using creative reading solutions. Um, and I would say that any teacher who's doing this uh, is not actually using a program that is implementing your own program in this case. I'm just kind of, I did that sort of silly thing to indicate the idea that this is something made up. I made up a program of my own. This is letters and words by Mr. D. This is not actually a real program. So what I want to emphasize is that data indicate that implementing, I'll stop, make, I'll make that stop moving. Um, data indicate that it is very effective when you implement a structured literacy program. And what I'll tell you is that uh, there are a wide variety of programs available and it is, uh, they are often similar in the level of quality that they have. So here, for example, and what I'm going to show you in a moment is that there are certain activities that you will want to see in a program uh, to make it clear that it's a good structured literacy program. So let me uh, lay out for you some of the key things that you'd want to see in a structured literacy program. So if you're a teacher and you're looking to evaluate a program, what I'm about to present to you are things that you would want to see in that program. And if you are a parent, these are things that you'd want to see that your uh, child's teacher is using to provide them with support. So the first thing is phonological awareness. We've already mentioned is one of those component skills. I mentioned before, it's the ability to detect and manipulate sound units of various sizes in words. And I gave you a sort of simple example of syllables and individual sounds, but it goes all the way from the word level. In the case of the word kitten is one level of phonological awareness. So there's the word kitten. Um, it goes to the syllable level by kit and uh, from kit and ten. Then we go down to onsets and rhymes, which have to do with breaking the kit part into the k sound and the it sound. And then finally, we get down to the phoneme level and the phoneme level is about processing the individual phonemes of the word. So like the K says the k sound, then we have the i sound, and then we have the t sound. And people often know about the term phonological, uh, phonemic awareness and phonemic awareness is sort of a subscale of phonological awareness. So phonemic awareness kind of fits into this model of, uh, phonemic awareness fits into the model of phonological awareness. And all of that um, is really critical. And all of that comes down to, we get all the way down to the phoneme level from the text level, the sentence level. This is the way you process the word. That's a cute kitten. And we take all of those, we break it into the words and we bring it all the way down to the phoneme level. And students need the ability to process sounds in this way. So let me show you an example of this. So a couple, a couple ideas for you, things that you I recommend that you do with students or things that I would recommend that uh, if you're looking to see if your child's teacher is uh, doing things that are helpful, these are a couple of things that you might want to see in a lesson. So two key skills in phonological awareness are segmenting and blending. So let me give you an example of how you might do segmenting. So I'm gonna illustrate it for you with the words on the screen. And by the way, I should add that um, uh, Kim uh, is going to send, Kim Renee and Lisa are gonna to send to you the, uh, the slides tonight so you can actually use this if you like to. So here is the way that I might do this. And you actually can actually look at the picture of me. It might actually be helpful to do. So for segmenting, I would say to you, the word is cat. I ask you what word. I don't think you're, you know, don't, don't consider it necessary to say uh, the word cat out loud uh, to your house uh, at home. Um, so you say cat, okay. And I say, say the sounds in cat. And I put up a finger for each word as you say the individual sounds. So you say k, a, and t. So I have you segment the word cat into three units. Um, you'll see here that I started with my uh, index finger here, but you can also start with your thumb. Uh, let's see, it's hard to do this on Zoom because you need to do it from left to right, but it's hard to see on Zoom sometimes. You can see here, hopefully it's not reversed for you, but you should see the this is on the left, and then this is the middle, and this is the right. And you should see it this way because that's, you should see it, yeah, that way, because that's the same direction as print from left to right. Uh, and so that's what you should be doing when you're teaching this to students. So you say k, a, and t. So you segment the word cat into k and t. 
uh, we could do the same thing with the word. Oh, and then last he says, good, what word? And then you can kind of put your hand, your fingers back together to say the whole word. So sometimes I'll do like this to hear the sounds and then we'll kind of blend them back together. Uh, for those of you who've done something like this before, it's really common to, let's see if I can use, get my sleeve out here. It's really common for people to do something like this where they go k at, you know, the students kind of do the sounds down their arm. That's fine too. I don't have a strong feeling about which way you do it. All of those ways are fine. Um, but, uh, but basically segmenting the word like that is helpful. And then you can put it back together at the end, just kind of summarize it to kind of re-blend it together. So we could do with the word goat. I would say the word is goat, what word? And then you say g, and you say o, and you say t. Uh, and I often, I don't require students to put up their fingers when they do these things, although that's okay to do too. Um, and then once you have read that, I say what word, and you put it back together, and you say goat once again. So that's how you do segmenting. The second thing is blending. So blending is assembling phonemes. So I'll start by saying something like listen. I'll say the sounds, you say the word. So I say d, a, g, and then I put up my fingers for sounds, and then I then I go like this to kind of indicate. So I do this kind of thing where I kind of blend across. So I put my fingers together, and I also move my hand from left to right to indicate or blending those sounds together. I've been told before that that sometimes might not be appropriate. I like it as a strategy, but sometimes people will say that. There is potentially problems with doing it that way. I, I personally think that it's okay to do, um, but uh, but some people will do a tapping strategy. So, and it's also, it can be, some people have a hard time like moving their fingers. Like I can separate this one okay, but some people can't. And so you can also do a tapping thing. So you can say, let's see if I can get this close on the screen. D, A, uh, and G. So you can, then you can, you can um, put those together like this. You can say, all right, I'll say the sound, you say the word. D. Ah, uh, g, and you say, what's the word? Dog, and then you can put them together as opposed to doing the sweep across thing that I did before. So I'll practice it again just to show you so you can remember, and if you're watching this video later, you have this as, as an access point. So let's do fish. So I'll say the sound, you say the word, ready? Well, I shouldn't have told you. Okay, well, the answer is fish, just so you know. Uh, so, f, and then it, and then sh, and I say, what word? And I Okay, what word? And I go like this, and you say fish. Uh, and so that's how you do a blending activity. That's all I'm gonna say about phonological awareness uh, this evening. What I do wanna talk about, uh, some of you may have heard recently that um, some uh, colleagues of mine, some great researchers, uh, David Kilpatrick, for example, has been uh, looking at using more advanced phonological awareness strategies and focusing on lots of manipulations, like changing the sounds and the words. Uh, I think that uh, David has uh, come up with a really good way of thinking about phonological awareness. The data for the uh, importance of that advanced form of uh, phonological awareness the data aren't exactly conclusive. So I'm not gonna discourage you at all from using uh, advanced phonological awareness strategy. I will say that you should still be limiting phonological awareness to students who have a very low level of language processing. One thing that I would say is that it's really important to get students into focusing on letter and sound connections, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, some people get stuck too much focusing on phonological, awareness and they don't move enough into phonics. There are in fact data suggesting that it can be almost as effective, uh, it might, actually the data suggests it might be as effective to provide students with phonological awareness instruction in conjunction with letters. You can still focus on the sounds but have students manipulate letters. Often people do that with little letter tiles, they'll make a tile for each letter um, sound and they'll um, represent those. I'll show you what a, what, a, what a tile could look like. For example, you put like for the sound ch, you put the C and the H on the same little tile. I'll show you kind of what that looks like in a moment. But, um, but it's really important to understand the two things I said. One is that it might be okay to use letters. The data are not entirely clear about that. Um, but more clear is that, uh, well, it's clear that we don't know whether it's necessary to do a lot of advanced manipulations of sounds. Um, these simpler manipulations uh, may be adequate. I say that not because I have evidence suggesting that these particular things are the best things. I say that because in many studies of reading intervention that have 
uh, included effective elements of phonological awareness have focused on strategies like this. So there just aren't adequate data to really say that you need to do that advanced uh, phonological awareness, but also not say that it is necessarily a bad idea. Uh, I really think that David uh, Kilpatrick does great work. And um, so, you know, so I just want you to kind of keep that in mind, but I don't want to, I don't, don't frame this as a criticism of, of the work that David has done. Okay, so that's phonological awareness. The second piece of the puzzle is to teach grapheme phoneme correspondences. So grapheme phoneme correspondences have to do with linking letters and sound. We already talked about that. Uh, that's part of decoding. So I talked about decoding when we talked about the processing piece. And now I'm gonna talk about how we actually begin that process, which is to teach students grapheme phoneme correspondences. So for example, with a letter like M, the grapheme phoneme, phoneme correspondence is associating the letter M with the sound M. These are sometimes called letter sound correspondences. I'll emphasize to you that, or letter sounds, I'll emphasize to you that some people don't like that language because it's not always a single letter. And I'll explain more about that in a moment. Um, it may be that some people call them sound symbol correspondences because um, it's a sound and that represent a set of symbols like letters, but it doesn't have to be just one. Some people call them sound spellings. That's actually the term that I like to use. Um, and the more formal one is at the top here, grapheme phoneme correspondences. Sometimes I call them GPCs, but you don't need to use that language. Sound spelling is really adequate. And, uh, and so here's an example of why you might not say letter sound. You can see here, here's the, um, the grapheme phoneme correspondence, CH says the CH sound. And so what's important to see there is that we're representing the C and the H as one unit. So it would be appropriate to call that one part. So if we're making like a letter tile, we would take this CH and put it on a single letter tile for students. Once we have identified the grapheme phoneme correspondences that we wanna teach, we then need to introduce them. Um, and I'm gonna give you an example of how to do this. So the example I'm gonna give you actually is is actually from the early 1980s, a researcher named Linnea Airy uh, introduced this approach to uh, learning grapheme phoneme correspondences that appears to be really effective. Uh, and data have suggested that using this approach can really help students understand grapheme phoneme correspondences. So, so we will, we're just gonna start with some language. We're just gonna give you an example. So I say, here is today's sound spelling. The sound is, what is the sound? Students or student, uh, that's the f sound. That's right. Now that sound has the spelling F. What is the spelling? F, that's right, you can see F right there. Now we have this clue card and the clue card helps us remember the sound spelling. This is a picture, what's it a picture of? It's the flower, that's right. So in the flower, you can actually see the letter F for the, you can see the spelling, I'm gonna say spelling, so it's sound spelling. I'm gonna see the spelling F for the sound F. So what is the clue that we have? That's flower. What is the sound that we have? That's f. And what is the spelling? That's f. So we can use this to teach students to introduce these. Now, um, so, so just be clear about what you should do if you have to do this on your own, um, if you don't have a program, is what you will have to do is kind of find a picture that you could use as a reminder of the sound. Uh, Dr. Airy did this by embedding the letters inside a picture. The data don't indicate that that itself is necessary, but what is helpful is to give students a reminder of the link between the letter and the sound by giving them a picture that helps them anchor that. And Dr. Eri showed that that was an effective approach when she did this um, early 1980s. And so that has been continued through a lot of effective intervention programs. So, and there's a final thing here is um, we say the, this, we say this, let's see, we say the sound of the, the clue, flower, the sound, and the spelling, F. And this is something that uh, really works well for students. Um, I will tell you at this point that there's a great resource for this. I didn't put in the presentation, but I'll ask, um, I'll have them share it with you afterwards. Is the University of Florida Literacy Center has come up with a set of tools that you can use to locate grapheme phoneme correspondences and to uh, come up with words and lessons to help you with that. And I think that they've done a really great job of providing that information. I'm gonna recommend that to you. And I'll, I'll ask them to share that with you uh, when I'm finished or this evening. 
Um, and so then we go from the graph and Fleming correspondences saying now we're going to read some words that have the sound spelling F that says the next piece of the puzzle is to decode words using a blending strategy. Um, I have only put in an example here uh, rather than giving you a written example myself, but I can do, do, I demonstrate after you watch this video. So the video is going to show a teacher using a blending strategy. Uh, this is mostly a really good video uh, to give you a sense of how the decoding process works. I'm going to recommend something slightly different than you'll see in the video, but it is a good example of how to do this. What I'll tell you, what you're going to see happening is you're going to see the teacher writing the sounds in a word one by one, and then having the students pronounce each of the sounds that go with the spellings, and then blending the word together using those. So I'm going to show you this video. I'll give you a chance to understand how you might use a blending strategy. And I'll say more about it when the video is over. So let's take a look. This is Allison Ish. She is a colleague of mine. Um, this video is, as you can see, somewhat, somewhat aged. Uh, this is from the early, mid 2000s when I was a literacy coach working with teachers. And Ms. Ish was teaching a third grade, fourth grade special education class. Many of her students were identified with dyslexia um, or other learning disabilities. And, uh, and so she was teaching actually a first grade uh, core program. So we didn't have a reading intervention that she could use. And instead she was using a core program that contained sound spellings um, like we had, like, like the ones that I had I just described to you. And it uses some fancy pictures you'll see in a moment. So in this class, you're going to see her using this blending strategy to help students understand words. So let's go ahead and watch Ms. Ish do the blending strategy. If you look up here, we're going to blend four lines using our cow card, but then we're going to blend two other lines with some multi-syllable words that are bigger words that are going to use some of our other sounds we've already used, okay? Are you ready? Yes. How many of you are ready? Raise your hand if you're ready. Jose, are you ready? Good. Hands down. Okay. First letter. Very good. Very good. Okay, special letters. Check the shell card sound. Good. Very good. I do not like it when you shout. Sound. Good. I want you to hold that sound for a second. Very good. You see the way you, you tweaked that sound? You turned it like the radio dial. You changed it. It's not a bout or a bout. It's a bout. Very good. What's the word again? About. Good. Read this row back. Very good. Okay, so that's a great example of a teacher using the coding strategy. So I'm just going to point at the word on the screen. We're going to use the annotation here um, to help you kind of see some of the key things. Let's see if we can draw on the screen here. Okay, so you see here is that she pointed at, you didn't actually, let's look at shout, which she, which she showed you there. So you see that she pointed with her fingers at the S and the H together to show that that was one unit that goes together. Then she pointed the OU together. The students knew that the OU said the OW sound. Then she pointed the T, and then she actually put these together. I'll say more about that in a minute. Then she had them read the T sound, and then she put all three of these pieces together. So this was the process she used for blending. So you can see here that she had taught her students about the SH, and you heard her say, special letters check the shell card. So that shell was the clue that linked the SH to the sh sound. So students could remember that the SH had the sh on it. She also had, she mentioned that card, the OU that was on that cow card. The cow card actually had both the OW spelling for the OW sound and it had the OU spelling for the OW sound. Both of those were represented there. 
And so you saw both the uh, both pronunciations of the or both spellings of the owl sound on that card, even though cow has no W, the OU is another spelling for owl. And so that was represented there. So she then pointed the OU and said that. And finally she pointed at the T. And, and then she had the students blend these together, the sh and the owl, shall. So what she wanted to do was to show students how those things came together. Finally, she pointed at the T, had them say that. And then she blended the entire thing together to have students kind of put the whole thing together. And then they finally said the entire word and she had them read back the entire line. What's important there is that she did this kind of in-between blending exercise. It's really important to know that there has been a recent study also by Dr. Ferry showing that it's helpful for students to, uh, to continuously decode a word. She didn't do it that way. Uh, Ms. Ish did it point by point. But there are data suggesting that it might be useful to go uh, part by part. So with brown here, you go brown continuously, excuse me, rather than going sound by sound in the way that she did. And at the time, we weren't aware of those data, but she has actually shown that that may build phonological skills better than uh, doing it the other way, where, um, where you go, you point at them and separate them one at a time. So that is, uh, so that's that. Let's see, I think I can take off annotation. How do I do that? Uh, okay, take off annotation. So that was an example of the decoding strategy, a blending strategy, and that's one way to describe a blending. The last thing I'm going to talk about is um, supporting students using a multi tier system of support. Uh, MTSS used to be called RTI. Uh, and so, so for those of you who've been in education for some time, you may know that, you know, things change and then come back with new names. Um, and RTI, Responsiveness to Intervention, an RTI system, was one that was designed by researchers and implemented by schools for a long time, uh, beginning really in the early 2000s. And it was a way to prevent kids being identified with disabilities by assuring that they had access to a high quality um, system of support. So in MTSS, uh, so then RTI, people decided, was not a great way to describe it because it was only a uh, academic approach. And researchers since then have wanted to add to it an important behavior component that um, academics and behavior need to be brought together. So instead of calling it RTI, it's now called a multi-tier system of support, MTSS. So if you were familiar with RTI, MTSS is the new RTI. In RTI on the academic side, so there is uh, there are behavior procedures also. I'm just going to focus on the academic side of it. There are several things that need to happen in order to implement such a system. So first, it's necessary to implement, uh, annotate here again, to implement universal screening. So first, you need to screen students to see if they're at risk. In tier one, this means looking at the needs of the entire school. So you actually look at all students. This is particularly true in the early to mid elementary grades. If we're talking about students in middle and high school. They've probably already taken lots of standardized tests that indicate that they are or are not at risk. So sometimes schools will skip the screening step for many students because they don't need that in order to identify that they're at risk. But in the elementary grades, um, usually there's a screening, especially in kindergarten, first and second grade. And they identify students who may be at risk. In addition to that, all students participate in grade level instruction, which is to say that every kid who is in a certain grade level gets the curriculum that's designed for their grade level. So it provides access to the what's often called the core curriculum for all students. And teachers will do that with differentiation is to say that they will adapt the grade level curriculum to the needs of their students, regardless of what they are, in order to assure that students can meet the grade level standards. So differentiation is a way of meeting grade level, helping students meet grade level expectations by giving them different levels of support within general education. So differentiation is a feature of tier one. And for those of you who are familiar with MTSS or RTI systems, you may have thought of differentiation as a feature of tier two, but it really should be thought of as a, teach, as a feature of tier one. So students who need uh, a, something more systematic tier two, it wouldn't be differentiation. Differentiation is looking at the grade level curriculum and using that grade level curriculum to improve 
uh, to provide students with access to the core standards for the grade level. So with that universal screening, you'll often then identify students who are at risk of having a disability in reading. And what we do then is that we then need to provide foundational instruction for kids who are at risk. So we identify those students, we put them in tier two, sometimes called um, a secondary prevention program, and we're going to provide them with foundational instruction to prevent them from being identified with a disability. So we can often do that. And, we, and think about this in terms of dyslexia, this is a key area that many students with dyslexia can make great improvement as I showed you before. And many students can actually make the adequate improvement before uh, being referred for special education services because they've been given uh, really good intervention, not even in tier three, which is often special education, but in tier two, where we are giving students foundational instruction that students are at risk, haven't been identified with disability, and they didn't pass the universal screening. So we provide that, that instruction uh, and we, in that context. So it's usually in small groups. It's usually relatively intensive. It might be in groups of, you know, four to six students. As many as six students is totally appropriate. Data indicate that even as many as seven students could be okay for a small group instruction. And then while we're providing this foundational instruction, we'll do progress monitoring at intervals, usually every two to four weeks to check student progress to see if they're progressing adequately. And schools will provide this instruction for somewhere between eight and 16 weeks. Typically we recommend between uh, eight and 12 weeks for a cycle of this. And after eight to 12 weeks, you identify with th uh, two to three progress monitoring data points to see that they've actually been making adequate progress or not. If they've been making adequate progress. They'll continue to focus on tier one. They have been making adequate progress. They, if they're doing okay, but not great, we might continue in tier two. If they have really uh, a lack of uh, response instruction, we would put them into tier three. And we would then provide foundational instruction now at the student's instructional level. I should have said here with tier two that we use uh, instructions about within a grade level of students, within a grade of students' grade level. So we're talking here about kids in the second grade, maybe a first grade or high kindergarten level. Can, in first grade, kids who are at a um, first grade, kids who are at a second kindergarten level, and so on. And so the tier two instruction is usually provided about that level. For kids who are even further below, two or more grade levels below, we're then going to provide those students with foundational instruction at their instructional level. So it's really critical if students don't respond to tier two as identified by progress monitoring data. They then go into tier three. And in tier three, we're going to provide them with foundational instruction using this, some, even for older students, we may be using, especially students with dyslexia, we're using the same kind of elements I described to you that should go into structured literacy. And with that foundation, foundational instruction at their instructional level, uh, we'll then individualize the instructions. So we'll start with a program that has been shown to be effective, that has all the elements of structured literacy that I showed to you, then we'll individualize that program based on student response. We'll monitor their progress even on a weekly basis, and we will then individualize the instruction based on how they're doing during the instruction. And we'll use diagnostic assessment to identify when students aren't responding to the instruction and make adaptations to make it easier for them to respond, make them more likely that they'll respond to instruction. Okay. So just to be clear about how, let me erase these things. Uh, okay. Clear. Clear. okay. Um, so just to be clear about how we're going to use um, data in this system. So when we use data, we look at the amount of student growth students are making in the either the screening or in the progress monitoring. If students are doing really well, which is to say that their progress is at or above a grade level benchmark, based on the universal screening, they just do tier one. If they have good growth, but they are close to the benchmark, they would participate in tier one and we might provide additional progress monitoring just to check that they're going to uh, adequately improve. Kids who have some growth, but it's relatively limited, we might then put them into tier two to make sure that they respond 
in addition to doing the tier one. And for students who show really limited growth after doing enough tier two that we should be able to see improvement, we'll put them into tier three and provide more intensive supports for those students. So, um, so that's it. That's all you have to do. And you, students will be successful if you do all those things. I'm being facetious, but, uh, but I will say that using those principles I've described to you, students should be really successful in um, making adequate progress. So to summarize, we know that reading comprehension can be uh, improved by providing students with good word recognition and language comprehension instruction. Students with dyslexia generally have problems mostly with word recognition, although sometimes also with language comprehension. We can build language comprehension skills by providing students with structured literacy instruction within an MTSS system and provide them with increasingly intensive supports. And if you just do all that stuff, because it's really easy, just kidding, uh, students will respond to instruction. So I told, um, told Kim, Renee, and Lisa that I would take 70 minutes and then we get a chance to ask questions. So we have 70 minutes or, and we have 20 minutes to ask questions. Wow, thank you, Dr. Kearns, for such an engaging presentation. Um, it, you've inspired me to pull my Beatrix Potter box set off the shelf and reread the tale of Peter Rabbit. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one, good one. You know, some, mom some moments that are surprising, but it's a good one. Yeah, yes, I was particularly impressed with your ability to find a visual for a rabbit pie. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> I will tell you, I actually made that one by myself because I couldn't find one either. So I just spent oh. a couple minutes on PowerPoint trying to figure that out. So yeah. Um, all right, I, there are a number of questions that came in the Q&A during your presentation, and yep. also there were several people who submitted questions in advance, yep. so I can't promise to get through all of them in the next 10 to 15 minutes, but I'll do my best to kind of, there were some themes that came up, yep. so um, let's start with one that, um, one pretty specific one that came in um, during your presentation. Is auditory processing a weakness for students with dyslexia? And if so, what strategies would you use to help those students? Yeah, so often, so auditory processing is not typically a term that I use. I tend to say phonological processing, which, so, so the difference is if you think about auditory processing, um, it's just processing of sounds. Phonological processing is processing of speech. Um, there are some data indicating that uh, there are actually auditory challenges some students have. It's not that they can't hear, it's that they actually are sometimes not as sensitive to changes in pitch and tone. They've shown that uh, in some cases, but I'm gonna talk about in terms of phonological processing, which is processing speech sounds. Yes, it is the case that many students with dyslexia have difficulty processing speech sounds. That is really often what's thought to be at the core of the word recognition and word reading problem is that they have difficulty processing sound information in words. To improve that, you want to use phonological awareness exercises, as I described to you, and you want to do those in combination with word recognition teaching, like using uh, letter sound correspondences, teaching a blending strategy, like I like I described to you. So yes, it's absolutely the case that students with dyslexia frequently have. Uh, phonological processing problems, and that good instruction of the kind I described is really effective. I'll add there that some students with dyslexia also have difficulty with um, processing speed. So, and this is actually true in languages besides English, that often it's uh, students' difficulty is not so much characterized by difficulty processing um, sounds, individually of processing sounds quickly. And so they've shown that that can be a, uh, a challenge, particularly in other languages other than English. In English, accuracy can be challenging because the letter sound system is a little more complex, but in a language like German, where the letter sounds are really simple, students will still have problems with uh, phonological processing speed. So yeah, there are absolutely things that can be difficult. Um, dyslexia, you know, for some people is a lifelong condition. It's remediable, we can improve it, um, but it turns out that some students with dyslexia may end up reading slowly relative to their peers. That's a frequent um, concern of adults with dyslexia is that they read more slowly than their peers who don't have dyslexia. And so there is a degree to which that is characteristic of it. Lots of practice is really critical and that goes along with providing the phonological instruction 
I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can actually see me. Um, the phonological instruction and uh, the phonics instruction I described to you. So kind of building from that, there were a number of questions about older students with dyslexia. Yep. Um, so can you just speak for a couple of minutes about uh, appropriate interventions for middle school, high school, and even adult students? And then sort of yeah. part two of that, there was a question about the role of morphology, morphological instruction. Yeah, so that's great. So I actually study morphological instruction a lot, so I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, so, I, so I'll just say to those of you who are secondary teachers, parents of secondary students, I gave examples using kind of elementary level um, phonological uh, instruction. But what I want to be clear is that the same types of strategies are appropriate for students who are at the secondary level who have word recognition problems. So the key is to identify the problem. For kids with dyslexia, it's, it's frequently that the words are hard to read. And you often see that on like a decoding assessment. So sometimes people will assess kids' phonological awareness. They'll do a task like they'll say, say cowboy, now say cowboy without saying cow. Student has to say boy, say, um, say cat, now say cat without saying k. They have to say at. That's one way to assess that. Students, regardless of age, will have difficulty with that. The second thing that you'll see is difficulty decoding, which is to say, if I show you a nonsense word, it'll be hard for you to read it. So, uh, so students, older students will have those same kinds of difficulties as younger students. And if you identify that they have problems with decoding and phonological processing, the same kind of instruction I described is going to be effective for those students. You need to find um, tools and programs that aren't designed for little kids. And I don't like to endorse programs. So I can't tell you like, this is one of my favorites, you know? Um, and there are, there are a variety of them that are really effective. Uh, researchers have done a good job over the past couple of decades coming up with ways to provide instruction that are effective for kids at all levels. And word recognition instruction for kids in secondary grades uh, can result in improvement and achievement, and it can be long term and it can result in improvement in reading comprehension also. So some concern people have is, can we improve reading comprehension with word recognition instruction? The answer is yes, that we can do that. Um, the effects in, um, in middle and high school are smaller than they are for younger kids. It takes longer for them to improve, which you know is not surprising. Also something some of your secondary teachers and parents have probably observed, but we can make a difference there using similar strategies to the ones I described. Great, thank you. Um, I also wanted to say that um, there was a compliment in the Q&A about your um, very clear and concise explanation of MTSS and <laughs> someone hoped that all teachers could, could hear this. So thank you for that. Well, you guys um, gotta post the video so they'll be able to, uh, they'll be able to listen to this later. Yeah, um, and building on that, one of the questions related to that was, um, you covered sort of guidance about the MTSS process, yep. but a little bit more specific. How about evaluating students suspected of having dyslexia who are English language learners? Yeah, so this is a really great question. So let me so let me expand it a little bit. Talk about instruction too. So uh, students whose language is first language is not English, English learners, um, they will benefit from the same kind of instruction in word recognition that we provide to their peers whose English, whose first language is English. So data have indicated that teaching about phonological awareness, teaching letter sounds, and so on, that will have the same impact and that it is effective for teaching those students. What's important to understand, and this is the tricky part, is that students who are, who are beginning to learn English, if they have difficulty with word recognition, it may not be that they're, you know, they are having problems with decoding, they don't know all the words. It may not be that they actually have a phonological processing problem or what we'd identify as dyslexia. It may well be that they just haven't learned the language well enough. The reason I say that is because one of the parts of the process of decoding is we sort of, you know, the bank example I gave is sort of like this. If you say b, at, and k, that's wrong, right? The word is bank, not bank. Um, and so you have to do this manipulation. Well, if you're an English learner and you're new to English, the word bank may not mean anything to you. So that little step in word reading where you guys bank and your brain does this kind of manipulation. They, I've done research, others have done research showing that that's actually a thing we do. That's harder. If you, it's hard to make the leap from what you sounded out to what the real word is if you don't know the real word. So, so it's important to understand that the reason students might not read words correctly isn't necessarily that they can't do it. It could well be that they aren't, uh, they just haven't learned enough of the language to do it yet. 
for the purpose of assessment, I, I hesitate to give clear guidance. I don't think there is clear guidance. Um, I, it is the case that there is concern, and I think some data to indicate that students whose first language is not English are overrepresented uh, in uh, special education when they may not have special education needs. It, it's that they haven't responded due to sort of still learning the language. However, there's plenty of students whose first language is English who struggle both with their um, native language, their home language, as well as with English, and those students do need support in English. One indicator of a need for support in English is that students have difficulty uh, reading and speaking in their home language. You might have some indication of phonological difficulties there. Um, you know, the US is really great in that we have a lot of uh, different languages people come from. So there are tests, for example, for Spanish, like the Woodcock Munoz, which does assessment for kids with first language English in uh, first language Spanish in Spanish, but we don't have those for other languages like, you know, Mandarin or, um, you know, my other common languages that aren't the same. So, so I would say that people need to be cautious. I, I want to, I don't want to give a clear, you know, I, there isn't a clear answer. I think, you know, this is true with identifying dyslexia in general, but I'll just say that you know, it's really important to be thoughtful and to recognize that a student who's been here for six months and hasn't learned all their word recognition skills may still be learning to acquire the language itself, the spoken language, the words and their meanings, rather than that they can't, you know, do the word reading. So, so that's about as good a guidance as I can give. But I will say that the instructional components I described, those can be effective for English learners. The only recommendation I make is some programs involve reading nonsense words. I don't recommend teaching uh, nonsense word reading to kids with um, whose first language is English because you don't want to confuse them. They're already learning a lot of words. Let's not add made up words to the mix. Um, but uh, but you know, it's it, otherwise that kind of instruction is really effective. Thank you. Um, there were a couple of questions around the brain research. One real specific, where can we find the research about changes to the brain that you shared? We could put that on our website if you sure. want to give us the link. Yeah. Well, I wrote an article about this. So oh, I, wrote an article, I wrote an article for a teacher uh, with colleagues of mine, Roland Hancock, Fumiko Haft, uh, Ken Pugh, and uh, Steve Frost. And so we wrote this article to kind of summarize some of the brain research on this. So you can read that article. It'll give you uh, a little uh, some information about that. We tried to really kind of break it down and help people understand how all the pieces fit together that I described. So yeah, so that's uh, so that will that'll be available to you um, as as a as a resource. So yep. Okay, great. Um, also related to the brain research, there was a question: How does new research in brain plasticity or brain imaging change the way um, treatment for dyslexia is evaluated or intervention? Yeah. So so this is interesting. So. So we've known since like the early 2000s, there have been data and it's accumulated since then. There was a study in 2014 where uh, some researchers kind of summarized all the data on uh, the effects of brain of intervention on uh, the brain and, and sort of patterns of brain activity. And they showed that yes, over you know the two decades that they've been doing this research, that there are data indicating that the brain will change. So, you know, you saw in the graphic that I put up there, you can see the brain actually shifts like in the way it processes, which is to say that the regions of the brain that are being used are different. And also it turns out that the, um, the way the uh, brain regions connect changes. So we actually use different pathways to make links between parts of the brain. And that is, you know, about sort of plasticity. That's about changing the brain in these ways. It is the case that, as I pointed out before, not all readers um, respond in the same way. So if a student has a really you know, serious phonological challenge, that their brain, for whatever reason, has a really hard time processing sound information, one of the things that some data indicate is that those students may improve their reading, not by kind of phonological processing, which is not exactly hearing, it's how you process signs of your brain, um, instead of actually just processing the sounds, they'll improve by processing the motor function of the sounds. So they'll actually be processing how they manipulate the sounds in there. Uh, they don't have to actually do it, but they'll be processing how they manipulate the, 
the motor articulation of the sounds and that may be the reason they improve, which is a little bit different than just processing the sounds, processing the motor articulation. The data on that are not conclusive, but I'll just say that we do know that yes, the brain will change. The brain does not change the same way in all kids. And in all, you know, all of our brains are different and they still can't tell you, we still don't know. If you give one kid a brain scan, we can't tell you whether or not that kid is, does, has this, that necessarily has dyslexia, is at risk for dyslexia. We're getting better at that, but we aren't at the point yet where that's, you know, that's something that we can entirely do. Um, but the, I think the key point is the brain does change in um, uh, sort of predictable ways. So it's not going to, you know, there, there are ways that we read that work well. There are other ways to read that don't work as well. And the way that we use the various parts of our brain changes systematically based on response to instruction. So I think I kind of answered that question, but yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, as I said, I, I wasn't able to get to all of the questions, but um, I wanna be mindful of our time and of all of your time and um, leave a couple of minutes here for Kim Day to wrap up. Um, if there are outstanding questions, please feel free to um, email them to, I'll put it in the chat info at idagegeorgia.org and, and uh, we'll, we'll include that in our follow-up email as well. Thank you so much, Great. Kevin, and yeah, I'm gonna turn it over to Kim. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, I wanna thank all of our participants for joining us tonight for what I consider to be a very informative uh, presentation by Dr. Kearns. I too enjoyed the uh, information on Peter Rabbit. <laughs> I have a whole new perspective now on Peter Rabbit. Uh, but Devin, we appreciate you uh, sharing research findings and also providing your uh, information and your insights on ways to implement the knowledge uh, from science uh, in our daily, uh, in our classrooms and also in our remediation program. So thank you. Um, a couple of housekeeping uh, issues. Lisa mentioned that if you have other questions, you can submit them to uh, info at idagorgia.org. Again, that is info at idaga.org. Also, uh, some of you have asked about um, whether or not you, uh, or how to get a, a certificate of attendance. Again, if you are wanting a certificate of attendance uh, for this evening, please email Anne Marie Lewis at info at idagorgia.org. Uh, uh, and then lastly, we hope that uh, you will join us for our other webinar, uh, webinars in the uh, Dyslexia Knowledge Series. Uh, we hope to see you on April the 14th when Drs. Uh, Lindstrom and uh, Schlesinger talk to us about what educators need to know about dyslexia training programs. And then again on April the 28th, um, when Dr. Nicole Patentieri uh, will talk to us about FCR, FCRR, Advancing Reading Through Science. So we hope to see you uh, at those, uh, at our other uh, webinars. And if you have not yet uh, signed up uh, for those registered for them, you can do so on IDA Georgia's website. So um, again, thanks uh, for attending. I hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you, Devin. And no, my pleasure. Can I just add one quickly, Kim? Sure. You can email me. It's very easy to find me online if you search for my name, Devin Kern. I think even if you spell it incorrectly, I'm pretty easy to find. And uh, I welcome you to email me with uh, questions and so on. Um, you know, I always say that people never email, but uh, you're welcome to email and I'll answer whatever questions I can. And you have, you know, there's a real, I will just say, these are really great questions. The ones that you guys got sent in advance and the ones on the screen are really great. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but uh, I will say the community is really thinking thoughtfully about all this, which is great. So thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure. Yes, and I will tell you that um, I know Lisa mentioned this earlier, but we've been getting lots of compliments to you uh, through the chat room. So thank you very much. My pleasure. So, uh, thank we you. hope everyone has a good evening. And uh, with that, I say good night. Yeah, good night, everyone. <laughs>